Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons for the third quarter of 2013, a series entitled Revival and Reformation. This is lesson number eight in that series entitled Discernment, the Safeguard of Revival. It's the lesson for August 24 of 2013. We hope that you have your Bible handy. We're going to look at some very important things and talk about some very important issues today. And we also hope that you're willing and ready to bow your heads with us as we begin with prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, how can we thank you enough for the many ways in which you've blessed us, particularly through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures, the works of the prophets and the apostles, now help us to understand how we can discern between what is true and what is false, between what is good and what is not good, to prepare ourselves for the time when the devil himself will be here to trying to deceive us. May that be our experience as a result of our time here today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Revival and Reformation, we've been talking about it for a number of weeks now, and in this series, uh, we need to learn how to determine what is a true revival and what is a false revival. There are those who suggest that the ultimate example or proof of revival is the, is the performance of miracles or the presence of miracles. And uh, wh how would you respond to someone who claimed, made that kind of a claim? The devil will come and perform great miracles in the end and oh, deceive dear. all but the elect. Well, what, what is a miracle? Something that we don't have an explanation for. Unexplainable. You think there's miracles going on in our world right now? There's a lot of things you can't explain going on right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is there a way to... Good. Go ahead, go ahead. Not all good. <laughs> Not all good. Is there a way to determine the source of every miracle? If something happens, can you be sure who's responsible for it? Well, which revival have you ever gone to where there's been a miracle? Well, I'm, I'm reminded, and some of you already are aware of this, that there was a TV evangelist some years ago who said that he had seen uh, some 40 resurrections from the dead, he claimed, at different places and different times. And he said the day was coming when he would capture a resurrection from the dead on live TV, and when he did, he would convert the world. Hasn't done it yet. I haven't seen it yet. Have you heard about it? Didn't some people think that miracles happened that later we could explain? Like in the olden days when maggots came on uh, dead things, people would think they miraculously came these bugs, and now we know there's a process. So what we see as miracles may not be miracles. They may be something we don't understand. Well, you, you, you may not have thought of this, but we have, there's an official committee to determine about miracles. You know about the official committee? Mm -hmm. Before you can become a saint in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. it has to be documented that people have experienced at least two miracles when praying in your name. If you pray to Pope John Paul and a miracle happens, you report to the Vatican, and they rack it up. When he gets a certain number of miracles, then he can become a saint. So sainthood requires two miracles? At least two miracles. Are these well documented? Well documented. Well doc okay. How do they document them? Well, that's part of the committee's work. I'm not sure that they disclose all their uh, the criteria. Ken, how do we mesh together uh, what you've just said and some of the letters in the New Testament where yeah. They open up referring to the saints, dear saints. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who are still alive that he's writing, other, you know, various authors are writing letters to, dear saints, to the saints here, to the saints there. How, how do we mesh that together? With the modern day miracle right, things? That you have to be dead and, and there have to be two miracles attributed to you versus what the New Testament says. Yeah. The New Testament, in the New Testament, the word saint meant someone who was called out to be separate and to be holy. Um, it has come to mean other things in our day. 
it's supposed to be a very special person with an aura around them. But we can, we can still take it the way the Bible referred to I it I hope as. so. Okay. Well, one of the worrisome things about miracles is something, for example, which is found in Matthew 7. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we, have, we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Now those people are obviously saints, right? <clears throat> Straight into the kingdom, right? Well, verse 23 says, Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. I think certain of those people can be used by the devil. How does that work? Well, there have been not very many, but reasonably documented. I, I, I've read little bits here and there that would indicate that in some of these seance kind of things, things do happen. And that's where the devil gets to us, if you get mm -hmm. yourself in that kind of company. So are you saying that miracles happen in that context? When I hear live fish have been brought in from who knows where and bounced off a table still flipping, and pet dogs have come in at, at the request of somebody, that makes me realize the devil is a higher form of life. He, he's no fool when it comes to deceiving. Uh, look at this verse. For false messiahs, this is Matthew 24, verse 24, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Can is that ask, scary? Can I ask a question? Yeah. This is titled Discernment, the Safeguard mm -hmm. of Revival. Yeah. What is discernment? Well, discernment, it would be to be able to tell the difference between two, two things. In this case, it would be the good and the bad, the false and the true. So when you know how to tell the difference between these things, that means the revival is going to be real for people who discern correctly? I, I hope so. Well, it sounds like we're not really finding the difference here because um, the, the people on the other side are going to be doing miracles also. And even some of the people that Jesus knew, you know, opposed to the ones he didn't know, yeah. probably have done miracles too. So there's not really discernment here. There's just telling you that, hey, both sides do miracles. Okay. Well, let us lay down some basic principles. The purpose of all true religion, including revival and reformation, is to get to know God better. Where do we find that information? The famous verse in John 17, verse 3, an eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Okay. So that sounds like... and. and we can add to that Hebrews 10, 7, which says, And I said, Here I am to do your will, O God, just as it is written of me in the book of the law. To do your will, O God. Okay? So anytime our eyes are turned away from Jesus to focus on our own experience. Now, and people who perform miracles, those who make all sorts of claims about miracles in our day, are they focusing on their own experience or are they focusing on Jesus? On their own experience. Well, they and talk what? a lot about Jesus, though. Sometimes. Well, <coughs> lots of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe talking about him in a sensational way. Yeah. But they're talking about him. Well, the Holy Spirit, who was responsible for giving us the scriptures, representing, of course, the Godhead, will never lead us away from the scriptures. Jesus himself said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. So what is the way in which the Holy Spirit interacts with human minds and experience? Through the Bible. Okay. People get really confused about the work of the Holy Spirit because he works at least four different levels and we sometimes mix them up and we you know, get all sorts of confused. So let's, let's be clear. We've got verses here and I'm not, not sure we need to look at these verses, all the details, but one, God himself through the agency of the Holy Spirit gives us life. Not one of us would be sitting alive here breathing and, and our heart beating, hearts beating and so forth 
if it weren't for the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's number one. It's very basic. Two, he draws us and woos us into living better lives. God is constantly trying to find ways to attract us, to bring us in, to, 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 to convince us to live lives like Jesus, if at all possible. Number three, he convicts and converts those who are willing to listen to him. So we, we, we talk about somebody being convicted by the Holy Spirit. What we're implying is that they've decided to stand up for the truth, they've decided to join the church, things like that. Convicted, converted, convicted by the Holy Spirit. That's level three, okay? And four, he gives spiritual gifts to those who have properly prepared themselves in order to build up the church. And that's the level at which a lot of people want to talk, and they sometimes they, they use references for some of these other levels, and they say they try to make it apply to this level. But at this level, and let's just look at some of those verses. Uh, for example, Ephesians 4.11. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. And he did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service and so forth. Okay? So those are the four levels at which the Holy Spirit works that I've been able to determine in Scripture. Can the Holy Spirit give gifts to anyone who's at level one, two, and three, or just level four gets the gifts? If I understand it correctly, and I'm, I don't claim to be the last word on this, but I understand that God does, gives gifts in two different ways. He gives us talents. Many times he give us ta gives us talents as we develop from birth. And but we may not even know that we have those talents, or we may not develop them, develop them properly until the Holy Spirit steps in and we're ready to you know, work with Him. And then He said, look at what you can do with this talent you've had from birth. That's one way. And what you can do for me, or what you can... Right. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. And secondly, there are other people who apparently, well, and, and the really example that stands out almost like a sore thumb from the New Testament, would be the disciples who, after the day of Pentecost, could go forth and speak any language, wherever they went, perfectly and fluently. Now that, that's obviously not something you developed from birth. That was a miraculous gift that the Holy Spirit just gave them like that. So those are examples of ways in which the Holy Spirit can Some of work. Those I haven't seen, though, in my lifetime. Yeah. So I've, I haven't seen any friends of mine Mm -hmm. all of a sudden start talking in a different language. Yeah. Um, so... There are examples. I, um, and I, let me take one that's a ways away so I'm not pointing fingers to anybody. Um, Ellen White went to a place up in, I think it was northern Minnesota, back in her day, and some people were there, had a relative visiting them from Sweden, as I remember the story. I'm pretty sure it was Sweden. And uh, they wanted to go to hear Ellen White speak. And this person who sp spoke only Swedish, she didn't want to stay home by herself, so she went with them to the meeting. And when the meeting was all over, she says, who taught her how to speak Swedish? <laughs> when all the others heard in English. All, all the rest of them heard in English. Well, I mean, how, and more modern times, I know of a case in, in, um, in Massachusetts. There was a pastor there who I believe could speak English and Spanish, but could not speak Portuguese. And um, he went to a church where there were a lot of members who spoke primarily Portuguese. And he, he said, I can't speak Portuguese. He got up in front and preached a whole sermon in Portuguese. As soon as he got down off the platform, he couldn't speak any Portuguese again. No, you mean, you know. I don't know, you, that sounds well, like, like a miracle I, to like me. Like I said, you know, I've heard these stories, but I've never seen it. Yeah. I've never seen it. So, Well, there are those who believe that the essence of religion and spirituality is to let God's Spirit take control of us. Now, you would say if someone's speaking another language, that's sort of like God has taken control, right? It is interesting to notice that when talking about the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, let's just look at that very famous passage. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and the King James says temperance. The Greek word is actually enkratia, which means self-control. All the modern versions will have self-control. So 
how does the Spirit give us self-control? Doesn't that seem like a contradiction in terms? Is that those two little angels, one telling us no, 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 and the other <laughs> telling us yes, 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 and the Holy Spirit tells us which to listen to? Oh, I, su <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that, that it might work that way sometimes. <laughs> well, let's ask a question. Let's ask a couple of questions. Why do we do what we do? Do what? In our profession? Everything. If you're a believer, let's talk about spiritual things particularly. If you're a believer and ask and are seeking to do God's will, what makes you willing to obey? Let's, there are three, three, and I might really say four choices here. And see which one fits us, or fits you individually. Would you say, I do what I do because God has told me to, and he has the power to reward and destroy? Is that why you don't murder or commit adultery? Because God says you mustn't? You would otherwise, of course, but you can't afford to incur his displeasure. Well, that might be all right for a beginner or a little child, but it seems that God's laws are arbitrary. It suggests that God's laws are arbitrary and do not make good sense in themselves. They're just, that does not speak very favorably of God. Well, maybe you'd rather say, as many Christians do, I do what I do because as a believer, God has told me to, and I love him, and I want to please him. Have you ever heard that kind of an argument before, or take off of that? Is this why you don't steal or tell lies? You would see nothing wrong or harmful about doing these things. It's just that you want so much to please God. For some reason, he does not like it when you steal or lie, and since he has been so good to us, you feel under some obligation to please him. It would only be grateful and fair, right? I mean, all that he's done for you. Again, this might be all right for a beginner or a child. It might even be progress beyond the obedience prompted only by fear of punishment and desire of reward. But it still implies an arbitrariness in God's commandments and does not speak so well of his character and government. So there's another possible uh, approach to obedience. Could you say this? And think about this yourself. I do what I do because I have found it to be right and sensible to do so. Does that sound more like self-control? And I have increasing admiration and reverence for the one who so advised and commanded me in the days of my ignorance and immaturity. Then hastening to add, being still somewhat immature, still somewhat ignorant, I am willing to trust and obey the one whose counsel has always proved to be so sensible when he commands me to do something beyond my present understanding. Now that's uh, some ideas that we have discussed and Dr. Maxwell used to talk about all the time. Uh, they're expressed in his little book, I Want to Be Free, pages 34 and 35. Unfortunately, here's the, un the fourth. Unfortunately, we tend to go back and forth between doing God, God's will and rebelling or sinning. So the lowest level of obedience is to say, I do what I do because I want to, and not because God wants me to. At that point in time, we are in fact saying to God, leave me alone for a little bit. I want to do what I want to do right now. What if a person says, I want to follow God? Well, then that would be number four. Yeah, well, I still want to follow God. Well, I mean, and you that's have to be the way careful it should. with the words because it sounds like you turn into a a robot. No, 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 no. It means if it's done for the right reason. It means if you choose to do right because it is right, and you recognize it, it's best to live God's way. For example, then that's. How do you, how do you find that out? What's God's way? That? No, in scriptures. Yeah, you do it because it's the right way. Well, your, it's your inmost you know, initiative. It's your, it's your motivation. I think some of it is maturity we grow into. You know, I remember mm -hmm. hearing a gentleman years ago saying, most of us go up certain lengths of Fool's Hill, but sooner or later we figure out that's not a smart thing to do. In a basic way, that's kind of what you're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a non-Christian person would live right because they don't get in trouble with the law. Yeah. And, um, well, but they haven't, really they, haven't made, they haven't made the connection 
that God is the lawgiver. And some of them are surprised when they get into the Bible, things that they have heard, they find out that that was God's wisdom to begin with. And mm -hmm. it's very surprising. But if yeah. I follow the truth, because I don't want to try, I don't want to follow falsehood. Mm -hmm. The reason why you don't want to follow falsehood is because it doesn't do you any good. Well, but so look, there's look. a reason for not doing that. Okay, but there's see, presumably the first three reasons I gave you, the one that doesn't involve disobedience, the three people you could watch them doing exactly the same thing and not be able to tell what their motive was. So this is a motive issue. And we're, it's not, it's, I can't look at you and say what your motive is. This is something you have to decide for yourself. So, and so the question is, and, and for those people who have studied Piaget and, 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 and other people who followed Piaget's thinking, this is based on that. The very lowest level, the, the level at which we all start out as tiny babies is we do something because we get a reward for it, or we don't do something because we get punished for it. We learn that fairly early. Most of us manage to get beyond that level eventually, and we say, well, I, I do what I do because um, that's the right thing to do. It's, um, it's, it's a requirement. It's, maybe it's, it's required by my society or by my state or it's the laws of the state or it's something that's like this. Or by the parent. Or by the parent, yeah. And so we think, okay, that's the right thing to do. That's a sort of a peer pressure kind of an approach. It's a very teenager kind of approach. You mean because of people that you don't do it? Well, because, well, whatever, your relationship is those because people. Because when yeah. you, because you can have those same things come at you when you follow falsehood, mm -hmm. and you may not want those things to come after you, and so you may change your mind then. You might repent of the falsehood because yes. of that. Yes, but you see, now you're fearing punishment. That's yeah, back to level yeah, one. Don't you think that the um, error has its own punishment built into it? Well, because if you don't say that, well, then you say God's doing it. Oh, well, oh, okay. Let, let's let's think about that. There are a lot of people who have. I mean, those are the Matthew seven people we read about earlier that thought they were doing all the right things because they thought they had to. And God says, "I'm sorry. Go away. I never knew you." The people who are the ones who are going to be in God's kingdom are the ones who say. I, I understand the reason for doing this, and I choose to do it because I believe it's the right thing to do, whether or not God has told me to. Now, we, uh, we recognize that, I mean, if we're truly Christian, we understand the scriptures. We, do, we, we really believe that God never asks us to do anything which isn't for our best good. So we're really doing what's best for us when we do God's will. But that's not the selfish thing. Satan's attitude is, it, doesn't, it, does, it may not seem selfish to do that. It, it, may, not, it, it may seem very, very contrary to what a na natural human reaction would be. But the, peop the person who has gotten to the level of maturity where they say, that's the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it, even if, it, you know, even if I die doing it, that's the right thing, and I'm not going to be swayed by what other people around me say, I'm not going to be swayed because someone commands me or coerces me. This is the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it. And of course, ultimately, those people will look in scriptures and they say, guess what? That's exactly what God told me to do. So let, let, me, let me give you some, a couple more illustrations. You, repeatedly, the Bible, repeatedly, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy remind us that spiritual life is all about following the example of Jesus. It's not just slavish obedience to a set of rules. And I quote, now this is Christ Object Lessons, pages 97, 98, written by Ellen White. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely. Now, does this person look like he's doing everything right? Mm -hmm. If you're watching him? Yeah. yeah. It looks like he's doing what's right. Obligation? Because he is required to do so, obligation, will never enter into the joy of obedience. In fact, he does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden, you may be the Pharisee and you're doing it. You hate it, but boy, you're doing it. Because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. In other words, you say, yeah, that's the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. 
the essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right. Because right doing, of course, is pleasing to God. Christ of Lessons 97 and 98. And the other side of that coin, now this is a quotation that's not nearly so familiar, found in Signs of the Times, July 22, 1897. A sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. All those, quote, obedient Pharisees were out and out rebels. You know, when you're, <clears throat> let's suppose when you're trying to break a bad habit. Mm -hmm. um, you haven't had any experience with that, so what are you talking about? Well, I've seen other people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jay. <laughs> um, you have an inclination to do things, mm -hmm. but, and you want to do that. Yes. But you are choosing not to do it because you, you know, you know, it's, it's, wrong. You know it's, it's wrong, it's bad for you, and you sure, sure wish you could do it, but yes. you're going to, I'm going to get over this by George, by Cracky. Yeah. And you know that by, by doing it, because you should, that eventually it will get to where it isn't the plague that it is. Yes. You also know that in the end, if it's bad for you, you're going to enjoy life a whole lot better without it. Mm -hmm. So Those are the kind of things you need to learn. But ultimately the motivation is, ultimately, you're doing it because it's right. the, the Lord is wanting you to do yeah. this. What well, about, such what, a one. What, what about, um, what about a, a sense of uh, an awareness or a feeling that you don't want to be an embarrassment to the Lord? You, you don't want to do this because you, you want to bring reproach on His name. You don't want to be an embarrassment to Him. Exactly. If you're doing it because you want to please God, that's the next step to doing it for the right reason. These are steps that we all go through. Don't think that some people just automatically start out up here. No, we all go through these steps. You know, I, th I, think, I think what you just said is very important, that, mm -hmm. that you, don't, you don't just necessarily want, there is, this is a step process. Yes. I mean, if you're really down here doing something that you shouldn't do or you don't want to do or whatever, that, that it is kind of a, it's a step-by-step -step yep. process, and along the way you can think that you're not doing it right, but but if it's that motivation to want to please the Lord, you that won't bother you. You'll get past that. Yeah. How do you develop <coughs> the desire to want to do right? How do you develop? By getting to know God better and better. You you, the expression is this: to know Him is to love Him. If that's, if that's really true, which I believe absolutely is, it is, the more time we spend focusing on getting to know him, the more excited we are about that. I mean, it's like getting to know a good friend. You, if, you, if you discover a good friend and you seem to have kindred spirits and you really enjoy spending time with that person, you don't want to do something that harms them. And, and God is a God of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So if you come close to God, you're his friend, a and righteousness develops in you? Yep. And, I mean, it, not everybody wants to do the right thing, but wouldn't you say most everybody does? Most well, everybody I'll tell you what. This has been studied very <laughs> extensively by people who study human behavior. <coughs> and the, the, the word is that 75% of people never get beyond the level where they say, do it because that's the rule, those are the laws, uh, this is a society, I, I, I support society, therefore I will do it whether I want to or not, I'm obliged to do this, I will do it. Is that the second level? That's the second level. What's scary about that is that society is creeping to calling wrong right, mm -hmm. and if you go by peer pressure and the laws of the society, you are going to not be doing right. That's right. Let me read you this next quotation in its entirety. 
A sullen submission. I don't know if any of you have known any Christians who had operated on a sullen submission. To the will of the Father, capitalized, that's God, will develop the character of a rebel. By such a one, service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Have you ever known anybody like that? I'm trying to think of, maybe I know lots of people like that and they're just hiding it real well, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, well sullen, do you know a lot of people who are sullenly submissive? Well, what about Daniel? Wasn't he sullenly submissive right? no. when he got thrown into the fire? Because he was going to do it if the Lord said whether he, what he I don't know if, what he's going to do, but Daniel I'm not going to. Daniel was. Oh, I mean da Daniel, though. That's what I'm talking about. Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or the lion's den with The him. lion's den. Oh, okay, the, yeah. the, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at that story, the Jonah, that side of the story there. Jonah was. Uh, but it, it just, it looks like there's examples in the Bible where people had to submit to God completely. And then, I, and then they had to, then it. I, 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 I disagree. I think when Daniel went up those stairs and opened his window and prayed toward Jerusalem, that was his favorite thing to do all day long. I think he did that. He said, come hell or high water, this is what I will do. Okay, but how about his friends, his three friends? He got thrown in the fiery furnace. Yeah. It, it says in there, I don't know if the God's going to deliver us or not, yeah. but yeah. Um, I'm, we're not going to bow down to this idol. Well, so he submitted, they submitted all the way to God in that definition. Well, not a but, sullen submission. No, this is not a sullen yeah, submission. Yeah, the definition this is of obedient. the word sullen, perhaps from, sullen. from the earlier time yeah. and today, we might have a little different feeling of the word itself. So well, uh, to me, it sounds like it's complete. No, sullen. No, sullen they, don't, they don't want to submit, but they will because of the uh, they're pressured into it. Well, it doesn't matter if they want to or not. No, I mean it, it does matter. That's the whole point. But but they they decided to to be thrown into the fiery furnace. But so sullen, they that wasn't decided. Sullen, sullen, wasn't sullen has sullen. a certain they didn't submit. grumpiness. About yeah, it. they did sullen. not submit don't to the. Want to do this, but you know. yeah, this is a Pharisee. He says, I don't like all these rules, but so help me, I'm going to do them. That's sullen submission. The simple version of that is the teenager when he's confronted with mother and dad about something, yeah. and he finally says, oh, all right. Yeah. That's sullen. But well, the first chance well, he can, he's going to sneak her out and do it, do it, do it his own way. This is a good no. point about preaching when you start using these words, because I right, started right. coming with out a with a different type of um, definition, no. and you came out with your definition that's all written down here, and it's, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody might read that and it come up with a different idea than what you said, Sorry or what you that. meant. Yeah. So we need to well, define our words. Well, I mean, sullen. Sullen. The word sullen means you don't want to do it. You're not happy about it, but you're doing it unwillingly. And you, and unwillingly. you don't see any good reason for doing it. Yeah. And to me, the getting thrown into fire. <coughs> it, I I it, think that it I think answers that, that definition perfectly. I think that I think these three friends were sullen about their obedience to the to the Babylonian government. I think they were not at all sullen I don't about think their obedience. They wanted to, them. to get thrown into the fire no. either. Well, but that was that's a, that wasn't God's rule. That was that was a Babylonian government rule. Yeah, but they did it because they were going to do the right thing. They were going to do yeah. it for God. Yeah. So what and they it? were going to joyfully do it for God, not sullenly do it for God. What does it say? Okay. Okay. Well, do the right thing. <laughs> Uh, without a promise of a reward or a threat of punishment. Yeah. It, I don't want to detract from the earlier quote there because I believe, of course, it is very important for us to be cheerful even, even amongst, you know, you know, on our way up the gallows or whatever. But uh, <coughs> just to add a little hope to someone that might be watching, though, and might think, oh, this is heavy because I don't feel good about everything. You know, we've got a long time, perhaps, if we don't pass away this very moment. But I believe it was Jesus also who told a little story that said, um, 
it, perhaps it was two brothers, one said, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. The father wants me to do something. I'm going to do it. And the other brother said, I will not do it. Mm -hmm. Later, the brother that said he would didn't, and the one that s said he would, would not, he did. Mm -hmm. And Jesus made an example of that and said, yep. you know, which one is better? And it was the one that uh, first said no, right. and then actually did the Father's will. Right. Yeah. You know, I, in response to uh, something Gary said there, intimated um, that the, the three Hebrew youth here <clears throat> were not looking forward to going into this fiery furnace. Um, speaking from very limited personal experience. In the fiery furnace. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> once you've had an experience like that or two, you realize that these, these difficult circumstances, uh, there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities here. And, and you learn not to shun those opportunities. They, they, unless you've had them or have that understanding, you don't realize there's really opportunities for witnessing or whatever. And I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be Jesus show up beside your side all the time. But it, it just the one or two experiences I've had, um, and you learn a lot, is that when you have something like this in your life, you just learn that, uh, that it, at the outset it may look like, my goodness, this is a real fiery furnace, uh, but there's opportunities here, and the Lord can make opportunities yeah. out of this. Yeah. Can you think of anything? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, you wanted and, to say and, something. Well, Go ahead. I just and looked you, and you learned, quickly. And, and you learn to, to recognize that and look forward to it. Yeah. yeah. I, le I looked up sullen in okay. Webster's Dictionary, okay. and it's gloomy or resentfully silent or repressed. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's Webster's number one. <clears throat> can, can you think of any, anybody among you here can think of something that God asks us to do which is not really long-term good for us? Well, that's, that's contradiction contradicting the <laughs> definition of God almost, isn't it? Well, I'm just asking you. If, but you see, the point is, if, if everything God asks us to do is really for our best good, then we ought to do what? Well, then the question comes up, why did he ask, and I think I know the answer, but why did he <laughs> ask the people in the Old Testament to do, mm -hmm. or, uh, why did he ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Yeah. Well, of course, that's another whole story. I know, story, that's another whole story. But, yeah. I mean, you know, those are the questions that are yeah. kind of come up from the stories in the Bible, and how do we answer those? Well, well so in, in the case of Isaac, let me just say a couple words. Abraham had been unfaithful to God on several occasions. And God says, okay, you know, this is the man I'm going to, for the rest of eternity, we're going to call him the father of the faithful. I have to have a demonstration that, in fact, he is really my friend, he is really faithful, so th that will counteract all those other times, not so many times, but other times. We have documented in Scripture when he was not faithful. And so this was God's final time to say... So ultimately, what God asked him to do was for our benefit. Mm -hmm. so not just for... And, and I might ask, if you read yeah. in Patriarchs and Prophets, at the end of that story, it says, it was for the benefit of the universe looking on. They said, wow! God really does have friends there on earth who are willing to do the right thing. So we don't always know when God asks us to do something, like jump into a fiery furnace. Yeah. Maybe we do. Maybe we do, but we don't always know. Maybe, well, maybe we should. Maybe, maybe every, time, every time we make a choice between right and wrong, the same thing is happening with us was happening with Abraham. We are being... It's more than just us that's involved. We're being, we're being yeah. this witness. Exactly. If I think I hear a voice that tells me to go kill someone, that's contrary to Scripture, and that's I'll probably not God. I'll take you to the sideboard. <laughs> Good. You're hearing yeah. voices. Yeah, I, I <laughs> talk to people who hear voices all the time. I haven't heard any yet, fortunately. Not those kind. Okay. Well, among those who claim to be followers of God down through the centuries, there have been a tendency, unfortunately, for large groups either to lean one way into cold formalism, follow the rules, whatever, 
or in the other ditch, what we might call fanaticism. How do we stay in the middle of the road? Is it, is it possible to keep, stay in the middle of the road? Keep your hands on the steering wheel, because mm -hmm. I like the way you said that, into the other ditch, because on both sides of the road, the road has a crown on it, so that the water will go to the sides. Well, and, what, uh, what kind of faith is it that overcomes the world? I'm reading from Ellen White. This is Review and Herald, August 26, 1890. It's also found in some other places. What kind of faith is it that overcomes the world? It is that faith which makes Christ your own personal Savior. That faith which, recognizing your helplessness, your utter inability to save yourself, takes hold of the Helper who is mighty to save as your only hope. It is faith that will not be discouraged. Now, faith means what? Faith means taking God as your best friend. It means trusting Him. Okay, is faith or trust that will not be discouraged? That hears the voice of Christ saying, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, and my divine strength is yours. It is the faith that hears Him say, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Review and Herald, August 26, 1890, paragraph 9. I, I always think of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. They were uh, whipped slaves. Mm -hmm. They had no strength. They had no arms or whatever. You have the king's army chasing them. You have a pillar of cloud over them, a pillar of fire. You have the sea splitting. I mean, they of themselves could do nothing. Mm -hmm. And they had faith in a God who did everything for them. Mm -hmm. And so we have to realize we're not mighty. We can't knock someone out or whatever. We have to trust that God is going to open up the waters and, and have us go through life. The very sad thing is Exodus 23 tells us that God said, just follow me. Let me do it for you. I will chase out your enemies ahead of you. I will give you the land without any effort on your part. And then you read through all their awful experiences through the desert and so forth. And finally you get to Deuteronomy 20 where God has to turn around and say to them, you go in the city, you go into the country, you kill everything that breathes, cut them up with your swords, et cetera, et cetera. And why did he do that? Because they weren't willing to let God do it for them. And how, what kind of, I mean, how can we be the glorious people that conquered this nation if God does it for us? But we have to learn that God will do it for us also. And, well, we've already noted that in addition to God performing miracles, Satan also has that ability. What do we know about Satan working miracles in our day? We've already read a couple of passages. Look at, um, look at Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. This second beast, now if you know the symbology of, of Revelation, you'll know that these beasts represent uh, earthly powers that are operating under the auspices of Satan, basically. This second beast performed great miracles. It made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone, and it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told him to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. What does that tell you? We have such lack of discernment that we can be bought off with a few miracles to bow down and worship something. The whole world is going to wander after the beast. Earlier in that same chapter, Revelation 13. God was suggesting that Satan will work miracles that are so impressive. Notice this. Every one of you, please, please take a print. And I, I, myself, I want to take notice of this. Satan will work miracles that are so impressive that it is not even safe for saints to expose themselves to them. Because you'll say, wow, you know. Human beings are often overwhelmed by what appears to be a miracle. Seeking for the spectacular is a dangerous thing to do because Satan will do everything possible to produce what he thinks might mislead us. Remember that true revival produces changed and obedient lives. So what are the results of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit? Some results 
seem to be evidenced by qualities in the lives of Christians. We already talked about Ephesians 4 that talked about apostles and prophets. But look at Romans 12, 6 to 8. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, now is that a prophet? We should do it according to the faith that we have. But if, if it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. Now that's, those sound like characteristics that we all could potentially exhibit, right? Well, have you ever spoken to someone who believes that she or he has received a special gift from the Holy Spirit? Maybe speaking in tongues? How do they feel about their gift? Very proud of it. Very proud of it. I used to work with a whole group of them that, as far as they were concerned, if you, ha if you couldn't speak in tongues, you were not a Christian. I know this lady in the gym, and she always says, God has told me he has a word for you. And then she would proceed to tell the person <laughs> what God told her was the message for that person. And she would go down the line, God has told me <coughs> this message for you. I can think of another lady who uh, had similar messages. Mm -hmm. And we call them the testimonies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Personally, I, I know a lot of people that um, thought they got called into the ministry in co at college. Mm -hmm. they, they were very sure that it was the Holy Spirit speaking to them to, come mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my experience with that. And what happened? Well, some of them turned out, some of them didn't. Yeah. So. Well, it's interesting. H have you ever asked, ever tried to challenge, even in a subtle way, people who claim that they have the gift of the Spirit? What, what kind of response do you get if you say, if you ask them even, you know, is it possible that that's not a true gift? The story I think about is way back in 1972, now I'm already dating myself, it was a long time ago, the full gospel businessmen's fellowship, whatever, big long name like that, decided one year that they were going to pray for Seventh-day Adventists that we would get the Spirit. And so they held meetings and inviting Adventist ministers and teachers and so forth and, and members to come to those meetings. And uh, there was a gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, an Adventist, who went to one of those meetings. And here were these people standing up and blah, blah, blah you know, all this language stuff. <laughs> and finally this guy jumped up and he blah, 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 like this and he sat down and someone was so excited sitting close to him, he jumped up, our brother just got us, brought us this wonderful message and this is what it is and da, da 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 And when he finished and sat down, the Adventist brother stood up, he said, <clears throat> he said, you know, he says, I teach biblical languages. And what I gave you was Isaiah 53, quoted in the original Hebrew. And I don't see how that has anything to do with what this guy just said was an interpretation of my message. And the whole, whole meeting just went <laughs> wet blanket on that one, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Jesus had a comment about that. You remember the story of rich man and Lazarus? What was his conclusion in that story, do you remember? If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets. Now, when we talk about Moses and the prophets, what are we talking about? Bible. The Bible. If they will not listen to the Bible, they will not be convinced even if someone were to rise from death. Luke 16, 31. And Wouldn't follow, that be a pretty impressive miracle? You follow through with that. Here, La the Lazarus had been raised, mm -hmm. the real Lazarus that we're talking about. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, the members of the Sanhedrin and uh, wanted to kill Jesus. First of all, they wanted to kill Lazarus, and then they wanted to kill Jesus. And well, they've been trying to kill, to kill Jesus for a long time. Yeah, but I mean, they plotted then to kill Jesus. But originally, they wanted to kill Lazarus, who had just risen from the dead. So that was yeah. pretty pretty true. How does God communicate with human beings? Through our brains. Does He have a way of bypassing our brains? Well, he must work through the nervous system or he, the creator. In other words, we, 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 uh, we wouldn't have the idea in our head. 
And I quote again from Ellen White, this is volume two of the testimonies. You commented about the testimonies. Page 347, paragraph two. The brain nerves, which communicate with the entire system. Now this is written back probably about 1860. Remember what they knew about physiology at that point in time. The brain nerves, which communicate with the entire system, are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. Whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric currents in the nervous system lessens the strength of the vital powers and the result is a deadening of the sensibilities of the mind. What does that tell us? Oh dear, we shouldn't be taking so much medicine these days. Hmm. Often people have used various substances from alcohol to hallucinogenic drugs to try to produce what they believe is a spiritual experience. There was a whole book written many years ago, How I Found God Through LSD. Yeah. And there's a reason why alcohol is sometimes called spirits. Yeah. If you, you know, if you, you, could, you, you could get your spirit from on high, or if you couldn't get it from on high, you could get it out of a bottle. But when and you people, get it from God, you don't have a hangover the next day. That's right. Just wanting to feel something? Yeah. So, and that's the point. You see, the idea was that you, you, you need to get this feeling, this rush, this whatever, in one way or another. And that's what it's all about. And God says, hold on, I want to communicate with you. I want to talk to you. I want to use the nerves that I put in your brain. And if you deaden those nerves by using various kinds of substances, you're not helping God communicate with you at all. Open the door for the devil to get right. Yeah. That could also be true with uh, certain types of music. Aha! Uh -huh. if, you're, if you're being bombarded by, by these things that you may not even understand, it's just constantly yeah. around you, audibly, you know, that can affect your thinking. What is happening here? Let's think about this for a moment. People in our world don't want to be good, they just want to feel good. So whether it's movies, whether it's music, whether it's drugs, whether it's street drugs, illegal drugs, whether it's uh, the internet. Okay. You know, I want to feel good. I want to do something that's exciting. I just want to be a part of, of whatever. I want to do something. And if our good feelings depend on some external influences, Guess who's going to learn how to control those external influences? The devil. The devil. Well practiced. And would it be correct to say that a person who is, whose life is basically controlled by external influences, which in turn are controlled by the devil, is demon-possessed? How is that for a scary thought? Mm, interesting. The challenge for each one of us is to spend enough time learning of Jesus so that our lives are transformed to become like Him. This will be our eternal goal. I mean, this is not just something we do now. We're going to be spending the rest of eternity trying to become more like God. We're going to be so excited about getting to know Him and so forth that that will be our goal for the rest of eternity. Is it really unreasonable that we should do that now? What does it mean to live a life of, of, of loving obedience? What kind of people will make up God's final remnant people? You know, Revelation 14, 12. Let us remember these words. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the travel for them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in His Word. They can honor Him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. How do we get a, a sense of what's right? Understanding God's government, his character, his purposes. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test, shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. 
Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Great Controversy, 593.2 in that famous chapter entitled The Scriptures, A Safeguard. So, what have we learned? What, what have we discovered in all of this? We have discovered that the devil is playing a very subtle game. At this moment, in, among, culture, among educated societies, he's playing very subtle. He's, in fact, wanting us to believe that he doesn't exist. In fact, many Christians today, uh, the more educated Christians, pastors and people like that, will tell you that they believe that the devil doesn't exist. And why would the devil want us to think that he doesn't exist? Advantage. What? Advantage. And what kind of advantage? Then when a miracle does occur, it's not because of Satan, it must be because of God. Right. And it, so whoever performs that miracle is God work, a God worker. Yeah, exactly. And he will convert the world by leading out, pretending to be Jesus, and there he is working miracles. I mean, how can you argue with a miracle? Satan doesn't exist, so it has to be God working, right? These are supernatural events. We have no explanation must be God. But how do you tell the difference whether it's God or whether it's Satan? Once again, the only safety is through a knowledge of the Scripture and a knowledge of the character of God. When they start, when that person who's working these miracles starts to say, and, and look at, follow, watch TV on Sunday mornings. And what, you, what do you see? They will, even some who claim to work miracles right on TV there, healing people and so forth, then they turn right around immediately and they say, well, Obviously, I have this connection with God because I can work miracles. Therefore, you should believe what I say and immediately they start saying things which are not consistent with the Bible. And what do you say? No, thank you. Well, God promises to impart to us the characteristics of the Holy Spirit if we spend time with Jesus in prayer, Bible study, and witnessing. And He knows which gifts and which fruits are most appropriate and most needed in our lives. If we work on producing the fruit of the Spirit, God can be trusted to give us the correct gifts when He sees it's appropriate. Don't you think God knows where to give good gifts and how to give good gifts? Jesus talked about that, didn't He? And God has prepared gifts for each one of us just when we're ready. See you next week.